You know, in my 53 years of life, I have lived in 13 homes, and none of them have been permanent. In fact, the house you see up on the screen is the one I grew up in South Florida in Miami, very, very tropical. But none of my homes have been permanent. They've all been transitory, probably the same with you. The Bible makes it very clear, though, that we're all going to be living in a permanent home one day, and that permanent home is called heaven. So I invite you to turn to Revelation chapter 21. We're fast winding down the book of Revelation. John will finish it up next week. And the title of this message is The Believer's Eternal Home. Now remember the context of what we looked at so far in the book of Revelation. In chapter 19, John talked about the second coming of Jesus Christ. He comes back, Battle of Armageddon, and then in chapter 20, he sets up his thousand-year millennial kingdom. Satan is bound during that time, and peaceful conditions will exist during that thousand years. At the end of the thousand years, Satan rebels, and then when we get to chapter 21 here, we now enter into the eternal state. John is going to describe, by obviously an angel giving him a lot of this message in the book of Revelation, he's going to describe our eternal dwelling place. And to be honest with you, anybody who preaches on this section really is at a loss for words to try to express what John saw. This is probably the most comprehensive chapter in the Bible that deals with the subject of heaven. There are a few others, but this one is the most comprehensive. And trying to explain it is like trying to tell a little kid about Disney World. I remember When I went to Disney World, my parents would describe it to me. You could look at it in a magazine, but describing it to someone, looking at it in a magazine and actually going, and I remember when I went for the first time, I saw the Disney characters. Remember how they carved them out of the hedges and you could see Minnie Mouse and Mickey Mouse and all that? Well, that's sort of trying to explain this chapter. Now, what John is going to do in this chapter is describe heaven, but he's going to focus particularly on the capital city of heaven. Now, we don't want to limit heaven just to the capital city. The capital city is the place where you and I will orbit in and out because Hebrews 12 calls heaven sort of a country. And so even though John does focus in on the capital city, and that's what we're going to look at this morning, heaven is much broader and bigger than just the capital city. You say, a city? Who wants to go to a city? I don't like cities, some of you may echo. I happen to like cities. In fact, one of my favorite cities is New York City. You've probably been there before. I don't like the crime. I don't like the theft. I don't like the worldliness, but I like the culture. I like the hustle and bustle. I like the food of cities. Well, this capital city is going to be unlike any city across this planet, and there are some pretty big cities, but this one is going to rival all of them. There are some commentators that believe that there are going to be multiple cities, but this is going to be the grand city of them all. So let's pick up in chapter 21, and what John's going to do here is give us several features of this capital city. First of all, I would have you note the names for the capital city, the names for the capital city. Now, the Bible gives a number of names for heaven, capital city. It's called uh, the Father's house. It's called the perfect thing. It's called the fullness of times. It's also called paradise. Remember, Paul talked about being caught up into the third heaven. There are many names used, but John here gives us three names for the capital city. First of all, it is called a holy city. Notice, if you will, chapter 21, verse 2. And I saw a holy city coming down out of heaven from God. Now, why does he use the adjective holy here? Because in all of human existence, all we know is cities that are corrupt, they're filled with violence, they're filled with crime, they're filled with theft, they're filled with prostitution. This is a holy city. It is pure. There will be no sin in heaven. That's going to be one of the great things when we get there is we're not going to have to experience any sin inwardly and outwardly. Secondly, he calls it the new Jerusalem. In verse 2, he says, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Now, if you remember, the earthly Jerusalem is God's city. That's the city that God dwells in. This is called a new Jerusalem. Why? Because it's different. It's coming out of heaven. It is pure. And if you read Revelation chapter 11, do you remember he described Jerusalem as Sodom and Egypt? Sodom and Egypt are bywords for corruption. 
And that's the earthly Jerusalem, even though God dwelled in the earthly Jerusalem. This is called the new Jerusalem because the people of God will dwell there. And he gives one final name to describe this capital city, and this one is the most glorious. It's called a beautiful bride. Notice, if you will, verse 2. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. You've been to a wedding before. You see how beautiful brides can be. It's like J. Vernon McGee. His wife would often say after a wedding, wasn't she a beautiful bride? And he would often say, I have never seen an ugly bride. Well, this bride is beautiful, the capital city. Verse 9 of chapter 21, he says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me saying, come here and I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. Now the question is, why is a city called a bride? Well, you have to remember what makes up a city is the inhabitants and the church is the bride of Christ. And so we're going to inhabit this city. Therefore, the city is called the bride. And if you've been to a wedding you notice at the wedding, as soon as the bride begins to go down in procession, all eyes are on the bride. Everyone is focused on her and her absolute stunning beauty. And so the focal point of heaven will be this capital city, and the terminology used is the bride because we are the bride of Christ. And you know what it says in Ephesians? The bride of Christ now has wrinkles, and we have stains and spots. But when we get there, there's going to be no wrinkles, there's going to be no stains, there's going to be no spots. And so these are the three names to describe the capital city of heaven. Secondly, I would have you note the location of the capital city. We've seen the names, now the location in verse 1. It says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. Now, John here obviously is reflecting back on Isaiah chapter 65, where God said to Isaiah, he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And so where will the location of this new capital city be? It will actually be either on the new heaven and the new earth, or it will be suspended above it. We really don't know, and it really doesn't matter because we're going to enjoy it. Now, I want you to notice the word new there, because commentators are divided on this, is God going to refurbish the earth when he creates a new heaven and a new earth, or is God going to create a totally new heaven and new earth? Well, I believe the word new here refers to the fact that God's going to create a whole new heaven and a new earth. According to 2 Peter 3 and other passages, God is going to uncreate the universe. Heaven and earth will flee from his presence, it says in chapter 20. And so God is not going to refurbish He's going to create a whole new heaven and earth. You've seen a home makeover before with the guy named Ty, and what he would do is he would take a home, he would go into it, and they wouldn't demolish the home. What would they do? They would go in and they would actually gut the house as much as they could, and they would refurbish the house, and then they would give it to somebody who was underprivileged. That's not what God is going to do with this planet. He will do that during the millennial kingdom. He is going to refurbish the earth during the thousand-year reign, but he's not going to do it in the eternal state. He's actually going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And notice what he says here, it's not going to have any water. Sorry for those of you who love the beach. Now, I happen to love the mountains. Now, there's going to be water in heaven, but it's not going to be the same H2O that we know because we're not going to need H2O in order to survive. Do you realize that three-fourths of the earth is made up of water? Your body is made up of 60% water. Your blood is made up of 90% water. And so when it says there's not going to be water there or seas, it's going to be a different kind of existence. We're not going to rely on H2O in order to survive. See, eternal life is not just a quantity of life. It is a quality of life. There's going to be a different quality of life. Now, when it says there's no more ocean or no more seas, that could be a metaphor for the fact that there's not going to be any separation in heaven. There's not going to be any sin. Because it says in Revelation 13 that the beast came out of the sea or the water. And that beast is the Antichrist. And so water here, when it says there's no more water, it could symbolize there's no more evil. And in ancient days, water would often create separation between peoples. 
And so there's not going to be any more separation when we get to heaven. That's going to be one of the great things because my daughter is wanting me to fly out to Alaska this year. She's in the military with her husband, and she wants me to fly to Alaska, which is a beautiful place. But you know what? I'm at an age now where I don't want to sit on a plane for 12 hours because it's deadly on my back. Well, there'll be no more separation. So we've seen the names of the capital city, the location of the capital city. Thirdly, I would have you note the benefits of the capital city, the benefits of the capital city. The first benefit is we will commune with God face to face. This is going to be the absolute pinnacle and peak of heaven. We're going to see God face to face. Verse 3 of chapter 21, and I heard a loud voice from the throne, that is God, saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is among people. Now remember, the tabernacle and the temple in the Old Testament, no one had access to God. Only the high priest had access to God in the Holy of Holies once a year. Here, the tabernacle of God will be among men. In other words, there's not going to be any barriers, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Verse 22, I saw no temple in this capital city for the Lord, the God Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. In other words, you're not going to have to go to a place in order to access God because God will be everywhere in an immediate sense. We don't communicate with God face-to-face at this point. Now, the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us, and we have sweet fellowship with God, but there's still this veil in terms of our intimacy with God. Notice what he says in verse 4 of chapter 22, and they will see his what? Face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Now, when the Bible talks about seeing the face of God, it's anthropomorphic language, giving human characteristics to God. God doesn't have a literal face. That term refers to intimacy. For example, in John chapter 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. That word with God in the Greek means face to face. In other words, before Jesus came to earth, he was face to face with the Father. He had perfect intimacy with God. And so one of the benefits of heaven is we are going to commune with God face to face. Matthew chapter 5 says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And you have to understand how unbelievable this is going to be because God said to Moses, no man can see me and live. In fact, when Moses went up to the mountain and he caught the backside of God, remember when he came down from the mountain, the Bible says his face shone like the sun. Listen, we are going to be in God's presence, and we are going to see His absolute glory in heaven. Face-to-face intimacy, there's going to be no hindrance. We are going to worship Him perfectly. We're not going to have to battle our flesh. You know, when my dad passed away in August, I was driving to work one day, and what hit me really hard was that my dad actually has seen God. He's in the presence of God. When you really think about it, it's like our Creator, who we talk about, who we pray to, we read the word about, we are actually going to see him face to face. And like that song, I can only imagine what's going to happen when we see the Lord face to face in perfect intimacy. But there's another benefit of heaven, and that is this, we will no longer suffer. You're not going to have to get up and go to work anymore. Now you will work in heaven, but you won't labor and toil by the sweat of your brow. No more conflict in your marriage. No more conflict with your children. No more physical diseases. No more riots in our society. Look what he says in verse 4 of chapter 21, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. No more crying. And there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning, any crying, any pain. And it says here, the first things have passed away. In other words, this order that you and I live in, this system is going to be totally eradicated. We're not going to be asking questions, I don't believe personally. I could be wrong on this, but I'm not going to stand in line asking the Apostle Paul, can you tell me what your thorn in the flesh was in 2 Corinthians 12? People say, I'm going to ask Paul all these questions. What is there going to be, a line of 2 million people and Paul all day is going, next, next, next. No, listen, we're going to be known as we are fully known. The old order is going to pass away. It's not going to matter, but his point here is, is there's not going to be any more suffering, there's not going to be any more difficulty, no more tears. If you've struggled with a physical ailment, you're going to have perfect health. If you have problems in your marriage, there's not going to be that conflict anymore. And that's one of the glories of heaven is we're not going to have to fight sin. See, part of our suffering 
is we have to fight sin. We have to battle sin. We deal with our weaknesses. We deal with our flesh. We're not going to have to battle that anymore. And so the benefits of the capital city, we're going to commune with God face to face, and we are no longer going to suffer anymore. Well, there's a fourth point he gives here about the capital city, and that is this, the certainty of the capital city, the certainty of the capital city. Notice, if you will, verses five and six. How do I know God is going to give me this capital city? How do I know I'm going to go there? He says, and he, and he who sits on the throne, that is God, said, behold, I am making all things new. God says, I'm making everything new. I'm going to make a new heaven, a new earth. I'm going to make new bodies. I'm going to make everything new. And he said to John, write, for these words are faithful and true. In other words, when God says he's going to do something, he says, write it down because my word is inviolable. When I tell you I'm going to do something, I am going to fulfill my promise. And so this capital city and all of heaven that you and I are going to enjoy, how certain is it? It is as certain as the word of God. And Romans 3 says, let every man be a liar and God be true. Why? Because God does not lie. He cannot contradict himself. God is the one who has promised it. Verse 6, then he said to me, it is done. In other words, once God creates the new heaven and the new earth and the capital city comes down from heaven, God will have consummated all of time, and he says, it's done. How do I know it's done? He says, because I am the alpha, that's the first letter in the Greek alphabet. I am the omega, that's the last alphabet uh, letter in the Greek alphabet. He says, I'm the beginning and the end. In other words, I'm the eternal one. I see time from beginning to end, and when I tell you that all things are done and that you and I will inherit this capital city, when God says he will give it to us, the Bible says God delivers on his promise. Why? Because God's not a liar. And you know how I know God's going to give it to you and I? If you're a Christian this morning, he's given you a down payment guaranteeing that you're going to get it. And that down payment is the Holy Spirit. In fact, the Holy Spirit is like an engagement ring. The engagement ring is God giving it to us, saying that there is more to come. And so the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you is God's guarantee and certainty that he will deliver on this capital city. Well, there's a fifth principle that he gives here about the capital city, and that is the inhabitants of the capital city. Who's going to be there? Well, he tells us in verse 6 and 7, I will give water, and water here is a symbol of eternal life, to the one who thirsts from the springs of the water of life. In other words, the person that sees their need for eternal life, the one who thirsts for eternal life, the one who hungers for eternal life. He says, I'm going to give them eternal life, the water of life. Notice it says here, without cost. You can't earn your way to heaven. It is a free gift. That is why it's by grace. You cannot earn it. You cannot deserve it. It is unmerited favor that God gives you. In verse 7, the one who overcomes, there's the one who will go to this capital city. He will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son or my daughter. And so you know who's going you know to inherit this capital city? The first inhabitant is only believers. Only believers will be in this capital city. No one else will be there. And listen, the only way you're going to enter is if you come to God acknowledging your need. And you hunger and thirst for God and you say, God, I acknowledge my sin, I repent of my sin, and I trust in you alone as my Lord and Savior. It's not enough just to believe. Believing is intellectual. The Bible says in John 1, to as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. There is a distinction between believing and receiving. Now, you got to believe, obviously, the facts. But believing the facts alone isn't going to save you. you got to receive it personally, and you have to be born again. They are the ones that will be the inhabitants of heaven. But there are some people that are not going. Notice who will not inhabit this capital city. Look at verse 8 of chapter 21. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexually immoral persons, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars... Their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You say, Mike, I'm in trouble because I've committed some of these sins. Who hasn't committed some of these sins? He's not talking about committing these sins. He's talking about a lifestyle. If you are defined by these sins as a lifestyle, 
you reveal that you're not a true child of God. And so these people reveal that they've never been saved, and so people that are non-Christian who have never trusted in Jesus Christ, they are the ones that are not going to enter this capital city. He says it again in chapter 21, verse 27, and nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination, see that's the key, practices, abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And so here's the question this morning. Do you know for certain that you're going to spend eternity in heaven in this capital city with the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father and all the saints and all the angels? You need to make sure, and here's the reason why. Because Jesus said, broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many are on that road. And you know what? There are a lot of church people that are on that road. There are a lot of church people that are not going to end up in the capital city. You know why? Because they were raised in the church. They're cultural Christians. They've come to church their whole life, especially in the South, and you know what? They think they're saved, but they're really not saved. You say, how do I know if I'm saved, Mike? Two ways, very simple. Number one, have you trusted in Jesus alone as your Lord and Savior? Not just believe, but have you trusted? And secondly, do you see fruit in your life? If you don't see fruit in your life, you better question whether the foundation is there. No fruit, no root. And so these are the inhabitants of heaven. Well, he gives us a sixth feature of this capital city, and this is where it gets juicy for you and I. He lists for us the structure and the beauty of the capital city, the structure and the beauty of the capital city. What is it going to look like? Well, listen, words cannot describe exactly what he's going to list here. In fact, when Paul died and was caught up to the third heaven, you know what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12? He said, I saw things that were inexpressible. I didn't have words to express it. And so we're just going to get a little glimpse. And I'm obviously inadequate to give the right terminology, any human is, to explain this. We don't know all the exact details, but God gives us a glimpse. And listen, this capital city is going to make the Taj Mahal look like a mud hut because it's absolutely beautiful. Let's look at its structure and its beauty. Verse 9, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, that would be the bowl judgments, came and spoke with me saying, John, come here and I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. Again, the city is called a bride because the church inhabits the city and we are the bride of Christ. Verse 10, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. Hallelujah. How many of you here love mountains? I'm a mountain man. I love mountains. And listen, I want a house at the base of a mountain. John is taken up to a high mountain. This could imply that there are mountains in heaven. And he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. It would be like this. If you notice the picture up on the screen, you will see Gatlinburg at the bottom here, and you see the mountains and you see the valley below. John here is taken in the spirit to a high mountain. Why? To get an aerial view of this capital city that is coming down out of heaven. And notice how he describes it in verse 11. Having the glory of God, her brilliance was like a very valuable stone like a stone of crystal clear jasper. Now, the best we know, this jasper is referring to a diamond. Some of you ladies love diamonds. This is going to be a diamond par excellence. And so, this capital city is going to be translucent. It's going to be clear. It's going to be like a diamond, and the glory of God is going to refract through it. It's going to be absolutely stunning. It's going to be absolutely beautiful beyond words. He goes on to describe it in verse 12. It had a great and high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels, and the names were written on the gates, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. So let me give you a, an inept picture here, but it'll help you understand Notice here, on the city, get this going here, I got it, no, nope, get it, all right, there it is, you'll notice right here, here's the city wall, here are the gates, and you have the 12 angels, and you have the names here, all around the square of the uh, capital city, you have the 12 tribes of Israel mentioned in the book of Genesis. Remember, the whole nation of Israel was built on the 12 sons of Jacob. 
And notice verse 13. There were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. It's a cube, so notice the gates here in this next slide. You will notice the New Jerusalem. You have the three gates here, the east, south, north, and west. Okay, and this surrounds, and you have an angel at each gate, and as we're going to see, each gate is made of one giant what? Pearl. By the way, this mirrors, if you go to the next slide, this mirrors the tabernacle, because all of the tribes camped around the tabernacle in this fashion. And by the way, all these stones that we're going to see that line the new Jerusalem in heaven, these stones were on the breastplate of the high priest. And so this is sort of a mirror of what God did on earth. Remember, whatever we see in this life, watch this carefully, whatever we see in this life is somewhat of a reflection of what we're going to see up there. Now, there may be some things different up there that are not on this earth, but a lot of what we see on this earth is going to be up there. It's just in perfection form, and it's going to be absolutely stunning and beautiful. Now he's going to get into the dimensions here in verse 16. Or let's go to uh, verse 15, rather. He says this, the one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. Now, what is he referring to there? Well, if you'll notice the slide here, here's the angel, and the angel has a measuring rod and is measuring basically uh, the gates and its walls. You say, yeah, but that's, that's angel measurements. No, he's going to say earlier, it's the same as human measurements. Now, remember, he measured the temple in Revelation chapter 11. And so God is giving us the dimensions of this particular capital city. Look at verse 16. The city is laid out as a square, a cube. Some think it's a pyramid, but it's a cube. And its length is as great as the width. And he measured the city with the rod... 12,000 stadia, its length, width, and height are equal. Now, if you were to translate that, what it means is this. The city, in terms of its height, depth, and width, is going to be anywhere from 1,300 to 1,500 miles. It's going to be cubed 1,300 to 1,500 miles. And it says, and he measured its walls, 144 cubits. That means its walls are 216 feet thick. You say, that's symbolic. No, by human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. So it's not symbolic. Verse 18, the material of the wall was jasper. That probably is a clear diamond. And the city was pure gold like clear glass. And so it's like a diamond, but it looks like gold that's clear. It's translucent. It's not opaque. This is something we don't understand. Now, here are pictures here to help you get a glimpse. Here it is. It's 1,500 miles tall, and it's cubed. Okay, next slide. This is the length. If you were to superimpose it upon the U.S., it would go from South Florida all the way up to Maine up here, and it would cross over the middle of the United States. That's how big just the capital city is going to be. This isn't going out of the city into the country, probably infinity. Next slide. There's probably what it will look like, the best that we can tell. It's either going to be this gold kind of structure, and as we're going to see, here are the gates right here, uh, and it's all around. It's like in a Rubik's Cube, and you'll notice the light coming out of it because that's the glory of God. See, we don't understand that we're going to shine with the glory of God because we're going to have bodies, and we're going to have the ability to reflect the glory of God. So this is going to be absolutely beautiful. It says the material on the wall was jasper and the city was pure gold like glass. Next slide. Here you get an idea. Of course, this is just a, an inadequate image of the idea. Now you'll notice those people flying up top. There is truth to that because Jesus' resurrected body, he was able to move and disappear. He wasn't subject to the laws that we know now. The laws of entropy will not work in heaven, obviously. There won't be a breakdown. So in other words, we're going to have body like the Jetsons. You remember the Jetsons growing up? Remember you can go up to the side and down and up? We're going to have that capacity to probably move, and we're going to move very quickly. We may think it, and we're there. 
We're going to know each other intellectually. Is there going to be a language? I don't know. But there's going to be one language, and obviously we'll communicate with one another. And look what he says here in verse 14. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Notice this one picture here, the foundation stones. You will notice here's the city right here, and then you have the foundation stones, and each one of the apostles' names will be there, a different color. By the way, just as a footnote, I don't think Paul is going to be there. He'll be in heaven, but I believe that foundation stone is going to be Matthias, because he's the one chosen in Acts chapter 1. People often leave poor Matthias out. He's like a nobody, but he was actually one of the ones that replaced Judas. And so these are the foundation stones. Now, to give you a picture, you'll notice it here. Up on the screen, we'll get to it in a minute, but notice what he says about these foundation stones in verse 19. The foundation stones of the city wall were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone, put the verse up, verse 19, there you go. The foundation stones of the city wall were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper. Jasper is diamond. The second was sapphire. That's a bluish type of color. We can't be exact on some of these because history has changed the categories. Chalcedony, this is a sky blue. He says the fourth foundation stone was emerald. That's green. Then in verse 20, the fifth was sardonyx. Sardinx, that's a red and white striped stone. The sixth was sardius. That is a deep red color. The seventh was chrysolite, gold and yellow. The eighth was beryl, that's sea green. The ninth was topaz, that's a greenish yellow color. The tenth was chrysoprase, that's gold green. And the eleventh was jansith, that's a violet color. The twelfth was amethyst, and that's a purple quartz. Now these are beautiful colors. Now if I was to ask you, what is your favorite color or combination of colors? Listen, when you get up there, the colors are going to be absolutely gorgeous. In fact, you will see them in HD. Here, we see them in a limited way because of our fallenness, our eyesight isn't perfect. There, we will see these colors in HD. And so the foundation stones, where all the apostles' names are, are made of these colors. Now, you can see the picture here that he showed earlier, if you'll put it up. There are the foundation stones right here. Now, isn't it interesting? Watch this. The gates, above the gates... You had the 12 tribes, one tribe on each gate for 12 gates. They were up there on the gates, but below on the foundation stones, you have the 12 what? Apostles. You know what this teaches us? The unity of the church. In other words, the continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament, we represent the people of God. All of God's people will be in heaven enjoying all the beauty of heaven. Go to the next slide. You will notice these are some of the foundation colors. They're kind of a quartz. Again, it's going to have so much more punch to it when we get to heaven. Next slide. You'll notice this one here. Some kid drew this rendition here. And here are some of the quartz colors that the foundation stones will have. Now, listen, the beauty of this is it's going to be a laser light show. What do I mean by that? Well, if God's glory lights up all of heaven and in our resurrected bodies... We reflect the glory of God. All this light is going to refract through a lot of these beautiful stones, and it's going to create an absolute breathtaking beauty. It is going to be a laser light show. It's going to be gorgeous. One more slide, or two more, actually. You'll notice here the pearly gates right there. Now, keep in mind, if the gates or the city wall is 1,500 miles high and wide, how big do you think this pearl is? Lady, do you like pearls? Can you imagine the size oyster that God had to do, obviously, to produce this pearl? And obviously, I'm being facetious. But it's going to be absolutely gorgeous. One other slide here, you'll notice. There are the streets of gold, sort of translucent, transparent like glass. That's the best we can do to try to get an idea. And then one other slide. 
He shows us here the transparent glass. It's going to be absolutely mind-boggling. It's going to be absolutely gorgeous. And listen, if you're sitting here, this is your future home. It's going to be permanent, and you're going to be able to orbit in and out of the city. It's going to be stunning. It's going to be beautiful. You know what? That's why you and I must not live just for the here and now. If you're living strictly for your retirement, you're a fool. There's nothing wrong with having a retirement, but listen, if that's what you're putting all your eggs into, listen carefully. You are burning your eternal reward, as we're going to see later. Well, he gives us a seventh component of this capital city, and that is the light of the capital city, the light. Verse 22 of chapter 21, I saw no temple in it. Typically, when you would go in a city in ancient times, you would look for the temple, whether it was a temple to worship God or whether it was false gods. People in that day were, were programmed to look for the temple because that's where the gods were. But there's no temple here. Why? Because God is not localized like he was in the Holy of Holies. I saw no temple in it for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. In other words, there is no location. All of heaven is the presence of God. Verse 23, and the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it. Do you realize with no sun or no moon, there's not going to be any change of seasons. There's not going to be weather. There's not going to be tide, uh, tides. There's not going to be snowstorms. There's not going to be ice storms. All of that was for this life to regulate our seasons and our times. That's not going to be there. No sun. And by the way, do you know the sun? I don't know the exact figure on this, but do you know how many atomic explosions happen on the surface of the sun on a daily basis? There are so many atomic explosions on the sun just to provide heat for this planet, and it's just at the right distance, 93 million miles away, in order to heat our planet. If it was further, we would freeze to death. If it was closer, we would burn to death. Do you realize how powerful God's presence must be if there's no sun there's no moon to light up anything. Why? Because God's effulgent glory will light up all of heaven. It says, for the glory of God has illuminated it, and its lamp is the Lamb. And notice verse 24, the nations or people groups. There's going to be people groups in heaven. They will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. What does that mean, the kings of the earth? I don't know. Some people think that there is going to be different stratas of society, but there's not going to be any competition. Now, this could mean this. The kings of the earth means that all their glory that they had on this earth is going to fade away when they get to heaven because no one is going to bring their glory into heaven that they had in this life. All their glory is going to be brought into heaven, and Jesus himself will be worshiped above everything else. And listen, if we maintain our identities in heaven, and we may maintain our identities in heaven, even though there are distinctions among races of people, there will be no competition. You're not going to have like in New York City, Chinatown. You're not going to have Little Italy. You're not going to have the Irish over here. You're not going to have the Polish over here. You know, cities are segregated. Why? Because of sin, because of walls. In heaven, we may have our ethnic identities, but you know what? There's not going to be any separation because there's not going to be any sin in that place. And he says here, in the daytime, verse 25, its gates will never be closed. Gates in ancient times refers to protection, and the point of the metaphor here is there's going to be no attack on heaven because there's not going to be any sin there, and so the gates will be constantly open. We could go in and out, and they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. Now, Randy Alcorn, who's written a book called Heaven, probably one of the best books that I've read on heaven. If you don't have it, get it. His name is Randy Alcorn. He's written a book on heaven. He takes a lot of liberty on some things a lot of his imagination, but it's a really good book. But he believes that based on the nations coming in and out of this city, there's going to be other capital cities, and they're going to come to the main capital city. We don't know that. That's pure speculation. You say, but Mike, how many people can fit into this city? Well, Henry Morris, who writes about this, and of course he uses, again, sanctified reasoning, he says, if we estimate that there's about 100 billion people that will have lived on this planet by the time this happens, assuming 100, 100 billion people have lived on this planet, 
He says, if only 20% of those people are saved. Remember Jesus said, broad is the road. Many are on that road. Narrows the road to life. So assuming out of the 100 billion, 20% of the people are saved. He says, if you take those numbers, everybody in the capital city will have 75 acres to themselves. 75 acres of land. Obviously, he's speculating there, but there's more than enough room in this beautiful city. Look what he says in verse 5, speaking of its illumination of chapter 22, and there will no longer be any night. You're not going to have to go to bed. You're not going to have to take melatonin. You're not going to have to have a sleeping fan on in order to get to sleep. And they will not have need of light of a lamp nor the light of the sun because the Lord God will illuminate them and they will reign forever and ever. Do you realize you're not going to sleep in heaven? You're not going to get tired. You're going to eat in heaven for the sheer pleasure of eating. You won't have to eat to necessarily sustain life. You will eat for the sheer pleasure of eating, and listen, you won't have to eliminate. No more bathroom breaks. You could drink coffee, as it were, and not have to go to the bathroom 20 times before the day is over. Why? Because there's not going to be any entropy, there's not going to be any atrophy, there's not going to be any dystrophy, we are going to have perfect resurrected bodies when we get there. Well, he mentions number eight, another feature of this capital city as we wind down, and that is this, the garden of the capital city. Let's look at the garden. And here, we go into chapter 22, even though there's a chapter division, it's still on the theme of the capital city, and he hearkens back to Genesis here. In verse 22, chapter 22, verse 1, and he showed me a river of the water of life. Now, you remember in the book of Genesis, chapters 1 through 3, there are four rivers that are mentioned in the Garden of Eden. Here, there is only one. It is clear as crystal. In other words, it's going to be water, but it's not going to be the same type of H2O that you and I know. Coming from the throne of God, this implies that God's throne is up high And this river is coming down from the throne and of the Lamb, and it's in the middle of the street. You know, one of the best trips I ever took was out west. Laura and I went out west, and the highlight for me was two things. Number one is I got to fish on the Grand Tetons. If you've never been out to the Grand Tetons, we went out to a lake. When I tell you, it was absolutely stunningly gorgeous and picturesque, and I'm sitting there fishing in front of this mountain. And then some of the waterfalls that we saw at Yellowstone Park were absolutely stunning. This waterfall is going to flow from the throne of God, and it's going to be absolutely beautiful. It's not going to be the same type of H2O that we know. It's going to be some type of water. And notice verse 2, it says, on either side of the river was the tree of life. You see, there's the garden metaphor. Bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, I don't know all that this means, but you can take this symbolically and literally. Symbolically, what this is saying is that we're going to have eternal life. Because remember the tree of life in the book of Genesis? God told Adam and Eve not to eat of the, the tree of life of good and evil. The day you eat of it, you'll die. They did, and they died. And what happened? God says, don't let them have access to the tree of life, lest they what? Live forever. So this is symbolic. This tree is symbolic of the fact that we're going to live eternally. There's going to be no sickness, no disease. The leaves, as it were, is a symbol for you and I having eternal life. On the other hand, some would take this literally to say this, we're going to eat in heaven. We're going to enjoy food, but there won't be any elimination. We won't need food, as it were, to sustain life. Then why does he mention healing here? I don't know. Some people think Eating the fruit is kind of like a divine vitamin. You take vitamins or supplements, not so much to keep you alive, but to help sustain life. And so in our resurrected bodies, we may be partaking of the leaves, as it were, or this fruit in order to help sustain life. We really don't know, but ultimately, this is a garden motif, and there is no sickness, there's no disease, there's no curse, there's no suffering. You won't have to battle any of that anymore. Like when you get older, you know, when you wake up in the morning and your knee is hurting? Lately, it's been my Achilles heel. I don't know where it came from. It came out of the blue, but I'm like, what's going on with me? I feel like the Tin Man. I need to be oiled all the time. Well, he gives one more component here of this capital city, and that's the activity of the capital city. We will be busy. 
Notice what he says in verses 3 through 5 of chapter 22. There will no longer be any what? Curse. You see, that goes back to the Garden of Eden. No curse, and the throne of God and the Lamb will be there. That will be the central focal point. And look what it says here. Love this. And his bond servants will what? Sit on a cloud and play a harp. Is that what it says? It says they will serve him. And they will see his face, verse 4, and his name will be on their foreheads. That speaks of ownership. And there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of the light of a lamp nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illuminate them, and here it is, they will reign forever and ever. You know what the activity of heaven's going to be, my uh, beloved? We're going to worship God, we're going to praise God, and we are going to serve God throughout all eternity. We're going to have assignments in heaven. Now listen, our assignments will be fulfilled perfectly. We won't struggle with our assignment. We won't wonder, well, what is my assignment? What has God called me here for? What am I supposed to do? Mike, do you want this assignment? I don't like this assignment. I'm bored with this assignment. No, none of that will enter your mind. But listen carefully. You're listening, say amen. Your assignment will be commensurate with your faithfulness to God here and now. The capacity by which you glorify God will be directly linked to your faithfulness to God now. You say, Mike, is that work salvation? No, it has nothing to do with salvation. You're there because you trusted in Christ. It has to do with reward. And your reward, which is your service to God in heaven, will be linked to your faithfulness here and now. So you know what that says to you and I? Don't sit, soak, and sour. Don't be a Sunday Christian only. You come to church and you say, praise Jesus, you, you tip God in the offering, and you tell the pastor what a great job he did, and that's your Christianity. Listen, you're going to miss out. Some of you are squandering your spiritual 401k. You're squandering it. You're so focused on your physical retirement, I got to get that retirement, got to get that retirement, you're not thinking eternally. Now, I'm not saying a retirement on this life is wrong, and I'm not saying you shouldn't plan for it. All I'm saying is that's not your focus. You know why? Because listen carefully, you can die tomorrow and someone else is going to get your stuff or no one will get it. So here's a question. Why are you not involved? Why are you not involved? You say, Mike, I don't have time. Listen, when you see Jesus face to face, do you want to look him in the face and say, Jesus, mm, yeah, mm-hmm, yeah. Well, Lord, to be honest with you, I just didn't have time for you. Yeah, and just, I didn't have time. You know, I was so, I was so concerned with my kids' sports and, you know, uh, and just doing other things. I, I was living for me, Lord. You know, I'm so sorry. I just blew it. And you know what Jesus is going to do? He's going to put his hands on you, and he's going to love you, and he's going to kiss you anyway, and he's going to say, welcome into the joy of your master. But you know what? You're going to lose out on reward. You say, I don't care as long as I get there. I don't know about you, but I want to enjoy all of heaven. Listen, what you weave in time, you will wear in eternity. What you weave in time, you will wear in eternity. So what have we learned about this capital city? We've learned about its names. We've learned about its location, its benefits, its certainty, its inhabitants, its structure and its beauty, its light, its garden, and its activity. So let me ask you a question as we close this morning. Why do you fear death? I fear sometimes the method, I mean, because we don't know, and we get it's the unknown, but you know what? Stop fearing death. Start being bold for Jesus Christ. Stop walking in fear. This is our home. This should bring us joy. This should bring us elation. This should induce our worship. This should induce our study, because we know ultimately where we're headed. And listen, every joy, every desire that you have will be totally fulfilled when you get to heaven. Do you realize that you will have no unmet needs? You will not go to this eternal city and have desires that are unfulfilled. God will meet everything in your life. Let's pray. God, we thank you this morning for giving us just a touch of heaven, reminding us of this capital city and the beauty of it, the glory of it. How wonderful. And Lord, we're like little children. We see in a mirror dimly, but then your word says we will see face to face. Lord, we look forward to this day. And then Lord, until you take us there, help us, Lord, to be busy, not only fellowshipping with you and 
walking with you, but Lord God, being a busy about your kingdom. We thank you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.